All right. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, we'll just jump right in. So um, we're going to talk about components of the irrigation needed for vegetable production, um, pressure, because that's going to be really important. And that's something that um, some people struggle with, either too much or not enough. Right. And then we'll talk about zoning and water needs. So um, just to make it real simple on everybody for vegetable production, drip irrigation is what we recommend. So um, from here on out, I will be only discussing drip irrigation. Um, so just be ready for that. So this is a layout that probably everyone has seen at some point. This is a, um, you know, they call it a typical drip system layout. And I think when people see this, they're really intimidated by what this is, because this is not typical for what I would expect someone to have here in Kentucky. Um, right. This is this is not what is absolutely needed to properly irrigate um, most of our farms. Um, if you're talking about hundreds of acres, you may need a slightly complex system, but um, for the majority of our growers, and certainly for high tunnel growers, this sort of thing is not is not what we need, right? But this gives you kind of an idea of what it could be, right? So honestly, this is a probably more what people um, could use, and you know, not necessarily this pump, right, or this tank, but this layout, right? So this is the main line, right? This. We call this the main line. This is the thing that is connected to the source of the irrigation, right? And then we have laterals. You can also have a sub main and we'll get into that, right? But um, this is pretty simple. And this is kind of, as this is a beginning irrigation talk, this is kind of the kind of level that I will be talking about um, today. So what do you need to get going for drip irrigation, right? You need pressure to move the water. That is first and foremost. And so before you plant a crop or for the agents out there, before any grower plants a crop, they need to have their irrigation situation set. They need to know where their water is coming from and that it's, it's ready to go. You do not want to be setting up irrigation after you have planted a crop. Um, so pressure can come in the form of pumps or gravity, right? Um, if you are using surface water, so a pond or something like that, um, you will need filters because the water will not be, will have sediment and particles in it, and that can create issues. Um, you need a way to get the water to the field, right? So a pipe or lay flat or some orchard tubing, something, right? And then your drip tubing, which is the laterals component, that's drip tape, what we call drip tape, right? Um, you need that. You need connectors for all of these components. Um, we probably, we won't be talking about fertilizer injection or fertigation today, but if that's um, something that people are interested in, we can cover that. We can do kind of a demonstration um, during the, the actual workshops, the in-person workshops. And then if you are connected to city water, municipal water, you do need some sort of backflow prevention. Right, so the main line, right, and the sub main. So those could be the main line for most vegetable producers. It could be PVC like in that Toro diagram, but for many of us, it's just going to be uh, lay flat. And right, so it lays, the reason it's called lay flat is right, is it lays flat when it's not inflated, right? So it looks just like a two-dimensional um, blue piece of rubber, right? When it's not inflated. And then once it's inflated, right, it's become circular. So this can be the main line. It may also end up being your sub main, depending on how many divisions you have um, in your field, right? And then your, um, tubing, your drip tape, excuse me, will connect, uh, direct, could direct directly to your main line, or it could direct, connect directly to your sub main, right? 
Um, and we will do demonstrations on that in, in the in-person workshops, right? And it can be really long. Um, so just, you know, you can see this one kind of goes forever. So depending on your pressure, this could be, this could be a pretty long main line. So if uh, many of you have probably seen drip tape, um, but maybe you haven't actually opened one up and looked at it. And so um, modern drip irrigation laterals, right, um, have these kind of um, channels and teeth, right? And there is a, an emitter every, and you buy it based off of your emitter spacing for the most part, um, four inches, six inches, eight inches, 12 inches. And so that is every, the from one emitter to the next, which is where the water is gonna come out, right? Right here um, could, will vary based off of what you've purchased, what crop you wanna grow, that, that may influence what kind of drip tape you use, right? Um, and usually I think for the most part, this drip tape is intended to be used for one season, but we are typically able to use the same drip tape for multiple seasons um, if you take good care of it. Um, so connectors, right? So the, you'll see something like this, right? Which is the connector that goes from the lay flat to the drip tape, right? They also make, if you have a hole, they make them where it basically has um, two ends that look like this. So you could connect uh, two drip tapes together, right? Or two ends of a drip tape together. Um, and, and that comes in handy a lot. Lots of different hole punch versions. Um, for the most part, and again, we'll go over this in the workshops, um, I have the best luck creating these holes when the uh, lay flat is actually inflated with water. That is when it's faster, in my opinion, to um, make these holes. As you can imagine, you also get water on you, but that's just kind of part of the game. Some people are able to punch holes in the lay flat when it is not inflated. Um, it does take a certain amount of practice to do that. Okay, so water source, right? So for the most part, a lot of people use municipal water, um, but a lot of people also use surface water. So this would be an example of surface water, right? Um, groundwater, I hear about this less here, but in other parts of the country, that is um, pretty common. And then rainwater. So here's here's a snapshot of a rainwater example. So they're collecting it off of a high tunnel roof into a tank and using that for irrigation. So all of these have pluses and minuses, right? So the municipal water, for example, is going to have lots of pressure, uh, probably way more pressure than you need. Um, but it's expensive, right? So if you're using thousands of gallons um, every day or week, right, depending on your farm scale or month, right, you're, you have a water bill. Um, surface water may be free, quote unquote, but it's going to come with sediment. There's going to be um, water testing probably necessary to ensure that you're not contaminating anything. Um, and you'll need a pump. Right? How does the water get from this creek up into the field? Um, certainly not from <laughs> gravity because it's got you've got to get over this hump, right? So there's going to be a pump involved and filters. Um, groundwater probably something similar. Pump definitely more most likely filters are going to be required. Rainwater free again, um, but right? It's dependent on how often it rains, how much it rains. Um, you'll need, ideally, you'd want to put a filter on this. Um, and this is low pressure. So free, but low pressure. Um, so all of these things uh, come with pluses and minuses, right? So let's talk about pressure. So for drip irrigation, low water pressure is somewhere between 8 to 15 um, pounds per square inch, PSI. Um, but you need, so those drip tape, the laterals um, are usually set up for somewhere around that range. So that's perfect, right? 
um, 10 to 15 PSI is needed at the submain. So every time you move from one, you know, every time there's a turn or a bend or another component added to your system, right, going from the main to the submain, submain to laterals, you're losing a little bit of pressure. And every time you scale down in size or your pipes, right, the way your water flow, you're going to lose some pressure, right? That's just how it works. So the larger the system, as you would imagine, the more pressure is needed at the pump, right? Um, one PSI is 2.31 feet of head. We'll go into that a little bit. So for municipal water, 40 to 60 PSI typically is what would come out of a spigot, right? Um, and so as you can imagine, that is way more pressure than you would need uh, if you're just irrigating a high tunnel or something like that. And even on at the UK research farm, sometimes the pressure, depending on the scale of our project, if we don't have a ton of uh, laterals, uh, sometimes the pressure is too high there, right? And we kind of have to play around with it. So drip tape suitable for PS for 15 PSI, right? You need a pressure reducer um, to make sure that you don't blow out your lines, right? And so these can be purchased almost anywhere. These can be purchased at Lowe's, right? They do break. And sometimes you, you aren't aware that they aren't working, right? Until the pressure is like crazy high. So that's something to be aware, right? Um, you probably want to replace these every few years because, or make sure that they work. Um, don't just assume they work. Um, on every roll of drip tape, you have um, kind of this kind of table. For the most part, we're using five eighths inch drip tape, right? And it talks about the thickness. We usually use eight mil uh, drip tape right? Minimum operating pressure is 4 PSI. Maximum operating pressure is 15 PSI. So this is what we normally are using. Okay, surface and groundwater. You will need to create the water pressure, as I said. So either with a pump or a tank or combination, right? So this is what you may commonly see, right? Someone's pumping it up from at least up from the stream, or the creek or the river, right? Up to a flat surface. And then maybe from there, it doesn't absolutely need to be pumped. Maybe gravity can take, take some of that burden, but for sure it has to get pumped at least over a hill, right? Um, gravity here with this catchment system, that would be doing um, the majority of the work. So there's a lot of pumps out there. You don't need a huge pump. Um, and so here's some tables and we can go into this more, but um, talking about gallons per minute at certain PSI, right? That's what you're kind of looking for, right? So again, you don't need a huge amount of horsepower. You don't Right. We don't we don't need even, you know, 30 gallons per minute would definitely 75 PSI would definitely cut it. Right. 25 PSI, depending on um, the size of your system, might be enough. Right. So looking at this pump. Right. Um, so max water flow equals 280 gallons per minute. Right. So something like this would be totally totally okay, um, max head or, and there's basically no head, right? Because there is, pump is pretty close to the water, right? And then the lateral or the main line comes right off the pump. Here, there is a lot of head, right? So, right, you're pumping, this, this is not a terribly realistic, but let's say you had a huge hill here so you would, this is a lot of head, a lot of work for the pump to do, right? So it's close to the water, but it's far away from wherever the water is going, right? So this is probably the better setup. Um, so in this, I think this is a Toro, again, this is a Toro table, pump performance curve. 
um, the flow rate, that's gallons per minute versus the pressure, which is just head or PSI, right? So you can look, right? You can, okay, I need 50 gallons per minute, or that's what I'm aiming for. Or, um, okay, I know my head or my PSI, right? And then based off of that, I can calculate how many gallons per minute roughly I'm gonna, I'm gonna get. So this is something that it, I, I did not think was terribly intuitive when I was learning about this. So, uh, because I think we think of a garden hose and how skinny a garden hose is and how much pressure comes out of a garden hose, right? But actually, the wider, the bigger the diameter of the pipe, the better the flow, right? The better the pressure, right? So you want to restrict up until, you know, you get to your laterals, you want to restrict things as little as possible. Again, because with each time, each time you downsize into in a pipe size or there's a bend somewhere, maybe you have to put an elbow somewhere. Uh, every time you do that, you're going to lose pressure and your water flow will be reduced. Okay, so thinking about irrigation zones, right? So this could be, this doesn't have to be a tank, right? This could be your spigot, right? So thinking about um, how to lay things out. Some of it is, a lot of it is dictated by your farm and your fields and maybe there's already roads in place. And so, right, you've, you've got to um, kind of go with what is already there in some instances. But thinking about where your water source is, how far it has to, how far the, the water has to go to get to the fields, right? So this, wherever the water source is, the pipe that leads from the water source to the field, right, is the main line. Then this would be a sub-main, right? This is a sub-main, right? So we, every time it branches off, you've now got a sub-main. You could, in, in theory, have a sub-sub-main if you absolutely needed it, but um, hopefully you don't. Um, but this is pretty basic, right? So you've got the main line, sub-main, laterals, right? What you wanna think about is how much can I irrigate at one time? And we'll go over that. And um, you want the ability to shut water off, right? You wouldn't want this area, for example, irrigating. I mean, maybe if you have the pressure, you could potentially irrigate both fields at the same time, but maybe you don't want to. So you need a way to shut this off and shut this off, right? And perhaps only irrigate one field at a time, just like this, right? There's a shut off, here's a shut off, right? So here's some other options. So you could have, here's your main line, here's your sub main a shut off, a shut off. For three fields, you could have this. Here's another potential setup. Or here. But you thinking about how much you can irrigate at one time and being able to shut off zones, right? So that you can focus the pressure on one field at a time. So how do you determine that, right? So again, some of it might be dictated by the setup of your farm and you may have to trim those fields and, and one field you'd want to irrigate all at one time, but maybe you can't, right? Maybe it's too big. And so uh, one of the basic things is how time, how long it takes to fill a known volume. So you could use a five gallon bucket or a 55 gallon drum, right? Uh, when doing this, you want to do it in the area where you're going to be irrigating. Don't do it necessarily at the water source, right? You could just to know, but let's say you have a long main line from your water source, right? You'd want to be filling that bucket at the source, 
or at the at the end point, right? Um, so you would divide the volume by the amount of time it took to fill that volume, right? So if it took one minute to fill a five gallon bucket, right, you got five gallons per minute, five GPM. If it takes 10 seconds to fill that five gallon bucket, right, then you've got roughly uh, 30 gallons per minute. So the drip tape that you purchase has a flow rate, 0.5 GPM per 100 feet at eight PSI. So if you know your flow rate, what size zone can you irrigate, right? That would be your next question. So let's say your flow rate is 30 gallons per minute. You're gonna divide 30 gallons per minute flow by the drip tapes flow rate, which is 0.5 GPM per 100 feet. And what we're talking about is linear feet, just 100 bed feet, right? And multiply by 100. So um, 30 gallons per minute divided by uh, 0.5 equals 60 times 100. So with a 30 gallon per minute flow rate, you can have, you could irrigate 6,000 feet right? So 6,000 feet equals that total length of drip tape that you could irrigate in one zone. So it could be 10 rows of uh, 10, 10 rows that are 600 feet long. It could be 20 rows that are 300 feet long, right? All that adds up to 6,000. You might lose a little bit there with each kind of bend if you have them, but for the most part, that should, that should be pretty accurate. Okay, so there is a lot of, um, for NRCS, there is a lot of encouragement out there from NRCS to have these um, water tanks for your high tunnel. Less, I, I see them less so with open field, but definitely with high tunnel, right? And this is, I think this is exactly the kind of tank that you could get from, um, with the NRCS uh, EQIP program. So if pressure is purely from the tank, right, it will be <laughs> ultra low pressure unless the tank is way up high, right? It is possible, um, but just keep in mind, it is possible to actually irrigate with just that tank and the rainwater, but you may not have enough water. It's not necessarily a pressure thing. It's actually like you're, you may not have enough water to irrigate with rainwater alone right? Um, because we go, you know, in the summer, we go weeks sometimes without raining or not much rain, right? You can pump the water up to a tank or be, you know, or just be rainwater collection, but just keep that in mind that, and we'll talk about amount of water needed, but just, you know, you most likely will not be able to rely on rainwater alone. Okay. So uh, this is a, pop, a little pop quiz. Um, which system has more pressure? This giant tank here or the little tank? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume people are thinking um, to themselves, but if anyone wants to answer it, they can. So remember that whole PSI and the head, right? It is the top of the water column. That is all we care about. We do not care about volume. So they have the same, they are the same, right? So whether you have 500 gallons or you have 10 gallons, it is the same. So let's, uh, and this is actually a, uh, so I don't know if any of you have ever been to West Six uh, Farm, the, the brewery that has the farm in um, Franklin County, but this is kind of what their system looks like. Actually, they have a pond at the top of a hill, which you don't see very often, um, or I, I haven't seen very often. So you have a pond at the top of the hill, and then there's a very steep hill and then they have crops growing down at the bottom. So this is actually like kind of a real world situation. So you do lose a little pressure here with the pump, but the overall 
right? We're looking at this. Where's the water column? And where's the crop? And so this is what you care about. Because you have uphill loss, but you have downhill gain ultimately, right? So as long as this hill isn't like so, the second hill isn't so big uh, that, you know, that water flow couldn't overcome it, um, ultimately, this is what you're looking at. So you see this in other countries a lot of times. Um, the My predecessor or a couple predecessors, predecessor actually, um, used to do a lot of development work and looking at um, low flow ear drip irrigation, right? And so people would mount things, right? Uh, mount their little water tanks. Um, so three feet, six feet, 2.6. So you'd get a little bit more pressure there. Again, this is on the ground though, right? So assuming even if this tank is completely filled to the brim, you may have maybe two feet, maybe three feet right here. Same thing here, this one's mounted. So you get, you know, maybe six feet right here on this tank. So you you could do again, those the zones with the tank. So with ultra low pressure, the irrigation zone will need to be much smaller, but the calculations and that whole the theory is exactly the same. Okay, so how much water to apply, right? And this gets tricky because there's a lot of factors. And so uh, Brent uh, Arnoldson is going to go into a little bit more on this. So I think that this is gonna be exciting, but this gives you kind of an idea, right? So for bell peppers, uh, 250 to 300,000 gallons per season per acre. That is a rough estimate. Right, tomatoes, five hundred to six hundred and fifty thousand gallons per season per acre. And here's a look at that crop water use. Right, so it's going to change throughout the season. Right, so depending on the size of the plant, um, thousands of gallons per day uh, per acre are utilized, and it increases. Right after transplanting. And then it kind of levels off, right? It kind of slows and then builds back up, right? So, but this makes sense, right? A smaller plant is gonna use less water than a larger plant. Here's just another example, right? So when you, I get that question a lot of how much should I irrigate, right? And the answer is, it depends. This also is just an average, right? It depends on weather um, and what's happening at that point. So, and Brent's going to go into this a little bit more, I think. Um, so we, we talk about tracking and measuring soil moisture. So it's also dependent on your soil, uh, the soil type you have. So in that soil moisture, the retention of soil moisture is going to be different based off of your soil um, texture, whether it's clay versus sand versus silt, right? And so direct measurements of soil moisture, right? You can use a tensiometer at six inches and at 12 inches, right? And it'll kind of tell you, okay, you need to turn on the irrigation or turn off the irrigation um, based off of um, the centibars that it's reading, right? So the higher the tension, higher the centibars, the more you need to irrigate, right? The lower you would need to uh, turn it off, right? So that, that this, the, and we'll go over this, we can go over this at the workshop. This um, installation is, can be tricky and a lot of people don't really like tensiometers, um, but they, they do have their purpose, right? Here's some other options, but they're, this is a, a little bit more user friendly, but the, the sensor is the same, but kind of the installation is still the same here with this. Um, you still have to bury this sensor, right? So it's, it's very similar in that way. Um, but this is kind of nice in that, right? It tells you wet, dry, right? It's kind of like a stoplight almost system. And so it, it, visually you can see it a lot better, right? So the down here would be drier when it's all the way up, you're good, you're wet, it's, it's, it's perfect. 
Okay, so drip irrigation can it, you know, is the only form of irrigation recommended for vegetable production. Um, this is from a pest disease and efficiency standpoint, right? You do not want wet leaves if you can avoid it, right? We don't want to encourage that, right? That's not the best way to deliver water. The water needs to go to plant roots, um, not on their leaves, right? You do need to figure out your flow rate in order to know how large of an area you can irrigate at one time, right? Um, also figuring out like, where's your water source, how far away it is, um, right? All that needs to be figured out before planting. Um, regardless of whether you're using a pump or gravity, the calculations are the same. Um, the amount of water applied is dependent on many factors, right? Crop growth stage, soil texture, temperature, humidity, um, and then uh, you can apply irrigation based off soil moisture, which can be measured using potentiometer. And we can go over that in the in-person workshop. So here's some potentially helpful resources. So these simple calculations for small drip irrigation systems. A lot of what I said is in this really great document. If you, it's, it is a fact sheet, right? You gotta work, uh, read it and kind of, I would, I would, and it gives you some sample calculations. Um, this fact sheet, HO120, is for ultra low pressure drip irrigation and rainwater catchment. We have a complimentary video that goes through this um, on the YouTube channel, there's the link. Um, and then the CCD, the Center for Crop Diversification, has a lot of other irrigation resources that's kind of pulled from multiple sources. So there's some options.